Good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this webinar where we'll be focusing on high yield leukemias and lymphomas for the USMLE and the COMLEX examinations. Uh, my name is Moses. I am a senior USMLE tutor with Blueprint and Med School Tutors. I've been working with students one on one for a number of years, hundreds of hours. Um, I'm also an internal medicine resident in Boston and I'm actually interested in uh, leukemia, lymphoma, and hematology oncology. So you'll see me nerd out a little bit today. And it's my pleasure to be sharing this high yield information with Dr. Shelby Parker. Shelby, uh, do you mind introducing yourself? Yeah, sure. Welcome, everybody. Um, I'm Shelby. I am a first year emergency medicine resident at University of Rochester in upstate New York. Um, I have also been with Blueprint and Med School Tutors for about three years now since my uh, MS3 year. So looking forward to going through this information with Moses tonight. Awesome. awesome. A very brief word on who we are before we jump into some high yield uh, knowledge for you all. Uh, MST and Blueprint, we are a collection of medical trainees, medical professionals, um, who are interested in working with you to achieve your goals um, through the both the examinations that we'll be discussing today, the USMLE and COMLEX, but really providing a suite of other tools for you to use uh, depending on your learning style. And as the slide uh, shows you, that ranges from one-on-one -on -one tutoring, residency consulting, um, aid with developing a study plan, um, really, we won't dwell too much on, on these, but we want to let you know that in addition to this webinar, there's a variety of, uh, variety of ways in which we can help you if uh, you so desire. And we'll have more information uh, about these opportunities at the end of the webinar, as well as a question answer session. Um, at a very high level, we'll cover, like I said, leukemias and lymphomas, and we're gonna try to keep this very practical for you and center our teaching around the high yield pathology and histology images that are likely to show up on your examinations while covering the clinical presentations, the basic science, uh, the treatment modalities as those are relevant. Um, and like I said, finishing up with a question and answer uh, where we'll try to clarify anything along the way. One brief point, we hope that you are interactive during this session. Um, please use the chat function. Occasionally, you'll notice we'll pause and ask you a question. That's because active engagement, active recall is one of the ways in which you can uh, further solidify this knowledge. And if you'll notice me looking off to the side or typing in the chat as Shelby is sharing her knowledge, it's because I'm answering a question that uh, might have come through the chat um, in a one-to-one -one DM to one of your co-attendees. So again, please be active in the chat. Um, being active is one of the best uh, ways to learn. I'll start with some general tips uh, that really apply to all questions, but certainly apply to some of these more esoteric uh, diseases like the leukemias and lymphomas. The first point I'll make is that all of the extra information in the form of pathology, histology, and, and other forms of data images are there to help you solve the vignette and pick the one best answer choice. It's not meant to clinch the diagnosis. You can get to the right answer. If you're somewhat unsure what the image is showing you, use the demographics, the laboratory values, all the clues that are embedded in the vignettes to help you get to the right answer. And one of the reasons we decided to put on this webinar is because we recognize that this is a topic that maybe you haven't seen clinically. It's not one of the stables of, of medicine like a heart attack or COPD. Some of these diagnoses are more rare and seen in subspecialty centers. So don't be intimidated by the amount of memorization. And really that dovetails nicely into my last bullet, bullet point here, which is highlighting that even though some of these diseases are rare, you can still develop schemas to help you organize the information so that the recall becomes a little bit easier. And along the way, we'll highlight some of the ways in which we do that. So for example, is the malignancy of the myeloid, in other words, related to granulocytes, neutrophils, basophils, or is it more lymphoid, the T and the B cells? 
clinically, this is something patients care a lot about. Is this an aggressive lymphoma that evolves in its clinical presentation on the order of weeks, potentially days to weeks? Or is it something that is more indolent that we can afford to watch and see how the disease process evolves? We'll get into Hodgkin's versus non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, but again, that's just a way to break down the lymphomas so that we can better categorize them and give patients the information they need. And there's a couple of other ways to break it down on this slide. And with that, really, um, we'll jump right into the leukemias. The big uh, division here is myeloid. Again, as I mentioned, myeloid refers to the granulocyte sort of arm of the hematopoietic system. And you can think of all leukemias as falling either into the acute or the chronic, and you'll see that broken down in the bullet points. Here is something that folks sometimes find a little confusing. When we typically use the word acute, we're often referring to the time course of the disease. In other words, acute shortness of breath. In other words, over hours perhaps to a day, a patient developed trouble breathing. That's not quite how we're using these words in the leukemias. Instead, acute means early. It means immature. It means that the cells that uh, are in the bone marrow have not had the chance to differentiate into fully functional components of the immune system and are stuck in a premature blast-like phase. Whereas chronic uh, malignancies refer to those in which the cells are certainly still malignant, they're not doing their job, right? But they are more differentiated, they're closer to their normal counterparts in terms of appearance and some of their biology. So over the next slides, we're going to go through all of these uh, diseases and let you know what is likely to be tested on your exams and what images you are likely to see. So with that, let's jump right in one of the prototypical diseases, acute promyelocytic leukemia. And the way I remember the complications and the presentation of this particular leukemia is the consequences of a bone marrow that isn't working. In other words, this leukemia has taken over the bone marrow or the bone marrow is somehow impacted such that the platelets are down. So you might expect evidence of bleeding whether it's small bleeds in the skin like petechiae or larger bleeds in other anatomic sites. Uh, if your white cells are not working correctly, then you might be more at risk of infection due to either absolute or functional neutropenia, too few infection fighting white blood cells. And of course, if you don't have enough red cells, the third of the main pillars of the hematopoietic uh, system, you might notice that they have signs or symptoms of anemia in the form of uh, generalized fatigue or pallor. Um, one side effect or one complication of APML, acute promyelocytic leukemia, is DIC, which is where there is derangement and a coagulopathy um, as a result of the leukemia, which may present as bleeding from IV sites in combination with clotting events. One quick word that MDS or myelodysplastic syndrome is sort of in the same family as AML or APML. It basically refers to a, a pre-malignant state that has a risk factor for leukemia. And some of the things that you might want to watch out for are Del5Q abnormalities. Sometimes these are treated with lenalidomide or other uh, chemotherapy agents. And in the lower right hand of this slide, you'll notice the Pelger Hewitt uh, or the pseudo Pelger Hewitt anomaly, the bilobed neutrophil um, that might come up on your examinations. Okay, so I've been talking for a while. This is where you all get involved. The questions in red are really high yield things that are just right for the testing. So the first question is, what translocation is classically associated with acute promyelocytic leukemia? This is where you all put your answers in the chat. I'll give you all a few moments to think about it. Thank you for the first couple of folks who have put stuff in the chat, keep it up. I'm seeing a lot of correct answers. Couple more seconds. All right, and absolutely right. Um, I've zoomed in there on the picture so we can answer subsequent questions. 
the T1517 PML RAR alpha translocation is the classic translocation for APML. Next up, the treatment. What is the classic treatment for APML? Go ahead and put it in the chat. And I will accept a couple of correct answers, and I'm seeing a few of those as well. Um, folks are saying all trans for aminoic acid. Other folks are saying vitamin A, all on the right track, because of course, all trans for aminoic acid is uh, a, a derivative, one might say, or is in the family of, of vitamin A. Um, and this is probably not going to be tested, but just in case for completeness, the latest uh, regimens include arsenic trioxide, and I'm, I'm seeing that in the chat as well. So arsenic trioxide in combination with ATRA forms the backbone of therapy. Last question for you all on this slide. If you, if you take a look at the picture here, you're seeing some needle-like uh, structures within the blasts. What are those called? And if I'm going to make this a little tougher, what are they made out of? So a, a two-in-one question here. Folks are absolutely right that they're called hour rods. Few more moments for folks to think about what might those structures, those hour rods, those needle-like structures, what are they made out of? And I saw one person put it in the chat. It is myeloperoxidase, MPO, perfect. This slide basically has everything you need to know about acute promyelocytic leukemia, at least for the, the step one and step two examinations um, and COMLEX. Um, anything to add, Shelby? Otherwise, we can move on to our next disease. No, that was great. And like Moses said in the beginning of the presentation, really pay attention to these um, histopathological images that we present on each of the slides, because often for these um, malignancy questions, they will have the images along with the question, and that'll be a really big uh, key player in helping you determine which, which one it is. So always pay attention to these histo pictures. Couldn't agree more. So next, we're going to talk about chronic myeloid leukemia. So we talked about an acute leukemia, and now we're going to kind of move into more of a chronic presentation. So CML is one of the leukemias that presents in an older age group. It's typically in males, and it's going to be like 50 to 60-year-olds, typically. Um, this one can actually be asymptomatic for quite a long time. So patients can have this for years and not even know about it. Um, eventually, when symptoms do develop, it's going to be a lot of the kind of constitutional symptoms that you think of when you think about malignancies. So you have your kind of generalized weakness, malaise fatigue, weight loss, um, things like that, um, along with splenomegaly and anemia and all of the findings that we talked about earlier that are associated with anemia, like the fatigue, pallor, weakness, lightheadedness, things like that. Um, patients with CML tend to have very high white blood cell counts, so over 100,000, super, super high. So that'll be one clue that you can look for in your vignette. Um, as well as basophilia, that's one of the unique features of CML. Um, so definitely look when they give you um, the complete blood count with differential, always take a look at that for these types of questions um, and notice that basophilia tends to come with CML. LAP being low is one of the unique features of CML. So LAP is our leukocyte alkaline phosphatase. Um, so this can distinguish CML from other types of leukemia and also from a leukemoid reaction. Does anybody, can anyone put in the chat what a leukemoid reaction is and what we ex would expect to see for LAP levels in that? Kind of a tough question. I'll give you guys just a second, then we'll get into it. So high LAP. Yeah, exactly. So a leukemoid reaction is basically how your body would react normally to an infection. Exactly. So Shamika said, seen an acute infection, the score would be high. Right. So this is one way that we can differentiate this from just a regular infection, um, or is this a malignancy that we need to do further testing on? Um, so definitely look for that in your vignettes as well. 
So now for some more kind of interactive questions, does anyone know the translocation associated with CML? Super high yield question. Yes, and there's a couple different answers for this one too. So I'm seeing 922. Yes, this is our Philadelphia chromosome. And then what is the name of the gene? Do you guys remember that? BCR ABL, love it. Good job, guys. So all of these little facts can come up on your exam. So make sure you know kind of all of the different names for this, all the different variations that it could show up as. So 922, Philadelphia chromosome, BCR ABL gene, all of those very, very high yield. And then what about our treatment for CML? What do you guys think? Okay, I see imatinib. Perfect, yeah. So what kind of drug is imatinib? It's a whole class of drugs that we can use for CML. Nice, so tyrosine kinase inhibitors, beautiful. So lots of different drugs that end in inib. So dasatinib, ponatinib, I'm sure there are other inibs that I don't know about, but those are three of the main ones that we use for chronic myeloid leukemia. Uh, Moses, do you have anything to add about this one? That was an awesome <laughs> summary. Um, just know that cancer is tricky. Every time we find one way to sort of beat it down, like a whack-a-mole, uh, you know, a resistance mutation will pop up. And so that might be a reason why you see some of these other tyrosine kinase inhibitors in your vignettes. But really, you know, imatinib was the groundbreaking uh, drug is the one that I would say is probably the most likely for you to see. So if you have to dedicate one to your memory, I would remember imatinib. The others are sort of brownie points in case um, the uh, test writers want to test your knowledge of the broader drug class um, and the naming conventions of those. But that was a, a wonderful summary. Um, I will take over and uh, chat a little bit about myeloproliferative neoplasms. And these are a family of bone marrow disorders that are often clonal. And we'll get to that because that's the question I'll ask you in a second about the genetics. But they manifest as too much of a cell line as opposed to too little of a cell line, at least in two of the three cases that we'll discuss. Um, so those three diseases, top to bottom as they're shown on the slide, is polycythemia vera. Um, and this is characterized by very high red blood cell counts. So, you know, I'm sure Shelby and myself, when we're in the hospital, we see a hemoglobin of 12 or 13 or 14, we're like, oh my goodness, we're, we're unused to seeing normal hemoglobins, but this is not even normal, it's, it's actually high, um, which is rather unusual to see. Um, and as a result of that, there is one hormone that is low, which hormone would you, if you were to test for it, would you see as low and that regulates red blood cells? And I'm already seeing one in the chat. Wonderful. So erythropoietin, right? So if you see a very high red blood cell count, and again, this is more of a schema or a way to organize um, polycythemia, um, you ask, is it being driven by excess EPO hormone, which might come from a different sort of solid malignancy that we're not going to discuss today, or is it EPO independent? And polycythemia vera is EPO independent. Um, and some of the clinical features that might show up in your vignette, very fancy sounding aquagenic pruritus. Basically, they take a hot shower and they get really itchy, right? Other uh, findings might be erythromyalgia, sort of a painful sort of reddish uh, skin uh, finding. Um, and that really characterizes the syndrome of polycythemia vera. The, the cousin disorder to PV, polycythemia vera, is essential thrombocythemia. And this is characterized by very high platelet counts. You know, a normal platelet count, you know, 150 to 300,000, let's say, you know, every lab's a little different. We're talking here 700,000. We're talking over a million in terms of the platelet count. And what's paradoxical, and I don't want you to get confused on this if you see it in the vignette, what's paradoxical is you would think that someone with so many platelets would have predominantly a thrombosis problem. In other words, those platelets clump and they create a clot. And that's certainly an issue. The thing though, is that these platelets are not normal platelets. They're, they don't function as normal platelets do. And so you can see either bleeding or clotting or both 
essentially um, in ET. Another question that sometimes comes up is, well, it turns out that sometimes patients with um, PV also have elevated, play, uh, elevated red blood cells, right? So what do I do if, if I see a patient that has really high hemoglobin and a really high platelet count? Is it PV or is it ET? And the, and the naming convention here is that the red blood cells win. So if the red blood cells are, are high and we're in a myeloproliferative neoplasm bucket, it's PV. ET um, can have some abnormalities in these others uh, cell lines, but that's less common. So we've covered play, uh, red blood cells being too high. We've covered the platelets being too high. The last syndrome is one where the bone marrow itself becomes fibrotic. And in this situation, sometimes the uh, counts don't tend to be as high in primary myelofibrosis. Um, the major clinical finding is the picture on the bottom right where you have dacrocytes or the teardrop cells. And the way I think about this is that the marrow is so fibrotic, it's presenting so many, that the fibrosis is presenting such a challenge to the egress of uh, red blood cells that the red blood cells get squeezed into this sort of teardropped cell as they try to escape the bone marrow. Um, the sort of basic science point uh, that might be tested for you all is that there is a gene that is the most commonly mutated gene actually in all three of these uh, disorders which fall under the myeloproliferative neoplasm. So if you were to give me a gene and a mutation, what would that be? Go ahead and Put it in the chat. And while folks are putting that in the chat, I'll just address a question that came up, which is what is the top, uh, the top right photo? And that is a photo of a, of a fibrotic bone marrow and sort of the, the stringy sort of darker purple in this image is the reticulin, which is a, a marker for fibrosis. And everyone in the chat uh, is putting in, I see a lot of folks putting in the chat, Jack2, Janus kinase 2. Um, and that is absolutely the right answer. In, in fact, it's the V617F uh, point mutation uh, that leads to these. I will say that I don't think that the USMLE or COMLEX is going to test you on the second and third most commonly mutated genes. So if you have to remember something, let me be very clear. It is JAK2. JAK2, you have to know. I think it's very unlikely that they'll test you on MIPL or calreticulin, which are the two other genes that are mutated in this disease. But again, I want you all to be prepared for every eventuality, so I put them on the slide for you. All right, that's all I got for MPNs. Shall we uh, move on, Shelby? Yeah, sounds great. So next we'll talk about acute lymphoblastic leukemia, or ALL. So unlike uh, the previous ones that we've talked about, this is a leukemia that's very common in young children. So like two to five years old, very, very little kids, um, at least for BLL. So there's kind of two different types of lymphoblastic leukemia. BALL, this is the one that you're gonna see in those two to five year olds. Look for that in the CNS and in the testes. So this is what we call the sanctuary sites. Um, so if you really want a nice mnemonic for this, brain and balls goes with B. And then for T, this is going to be your teenagers. Um, where do these kids have the mass? Where will you find this mass? Mediastinal. Love it. Yeah, so teenagers and young adults with TALL, you're gonna be looking for a mediastinal mass. And we'll show you guys a nice picture of that coming up in just a second. Um, so lymphoblastic leukemia implies that this is a cancer of blast cells. So these are immature cells here. And you can see in the picture, they're the big purple cells. They don't look very well differentiated. These are immature cells kind of crowding out the bone marrow. So you're going to see a lot of the similar symptoms that some of these other malignancies have, anemia and things like that, because the bone marrow is just full of these blast cells. So some of the symptomatology may look similar, but they'll give you more clues in the vignette as to what they're looking for. So sometimes they'll be looking for, you know, the mutation um, or, you know, where the tumor is going to be. So just kind of look for the context clues and they'll, they'll have to give you something to help you answer the question. 
Um, so some of the more common markers that they may test you on, tumor markers, are going to be your TDT and your CD10. So look for those as keys in the vignette when they want you to, to think about ALL. And then our translocation, this is a must-know thing. What is the translocation commonly associated with ALL? 1221. Love it. Yes. So 1221 is the translocation. And this one has actually a fairly good prognosis. Um, so that's good to know, especially since these are young people with this disease. Um, keep in mind also there's a pretty large um, genetic association between ALL and Down syndrome. So a lot of the patients in these questions will um, also have trisomy 21, um, which makes sense because the translocation is on chromosome 21. Um, so that's pretty much it for ALL. That one is a very, very high yield malignancy. All fall down. Oh, I like that. I actually haven't heard that uh, memory trick before, but I like that. I'll fall down. Um, here is a great picture of our large, large mediastinal mass that we see in key ALL. So remember, this is going to be your teenagers and young adults. And we're highlighting here, A is our chest x-ray, B is our chest CT, showing this very, very large mediastinal mass. Okay. Um, Moses, anything to add about ALL? The only thing I would the only thing I would add is that the smear for ALL looks basically identical to the smear for AML or APML. So if you just have the picture by itself, you cannot tell whether it's myeloid or lymphoid. They all look blast-like, immature, early forms. You need markers, you need genetics, the clues from demographics to help you get that diagnosis. I don't want you all to be fooled. Of course, if you see um, our rods, well, that's myeloperoxidase, so that's myeloid, and that can um, make the diagnosis of a myeloid malignancy, but not all cases will have our rods. Um, with that, I will pivot to CLL, chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Um, this, again, just to reorient ourselves, we're talking about acute leukemias, which are uh, immature. They tend to present acutely as well, although that's not quite what the name is meant to describe, but it, that does tend to be the case. Um, and then you have your chronic leukemias, which are slower, more indolent, more differentiated cells. So we just finished talking about the myeloid column, right? And, uh, or sorry, the, the, yes, the myeloid column, and now we're moving into the lymphoid column. So chronic, meaning that these are more differentiated, um, and they're lymphoid. So this tends to be a malignancy of older individuals. Like I said, chronic, so slow progression. The things that we worry about are the transformations to more aggressive lymphomas, like a diffuse large B cell lymphoma, the so-called Richter's transformation. And there's some complications like an autoimmune hemolytic anemia that can coexist with uh, CLL. Um, the, there's a very classic uh, sort of morphologic uh, finding on a smear that I'm showing in the image to the right. So folks in the chat, go ahead. What are we looking at here that is uh, pathognomonic for CLL? And you all are all over this. These are smudge cells. The lymphocytes are fragile. When you um, smear out on the slide, the, the blood and, and then prepare the slide, it tends to disrupt these, uh, these malignant lymphocytes and you end up with these sort of crushed looking, crushed looking cells. Um, I'll, there's a question here about what can CLL transform into? Very strange to have it transform into ALL because that would mean that it would have to have an earlier differentiation block. I would consider these essentially separate diseases for sure for the boards, but also pretty much um, for, for real life as well. That would be extremely uncommon. The other thing I will note, and it's not on the slide, but SLL, so uh, is sort of the lymphoma version of CLL. Richter's is for um, the transformation to an aggressive lymphoma like DLBCL. Yep. Anything to add, Shelby? No, that was great. All right.
All right, so hairy cell leukemia. This picture is probably one of the more recognizable of all of the different leukemias. So you can see that cell on the right there has these very characteristic hairy projections. Um, so this is how we will almost immediately know that this is gonna be our hairy cell leukemia. So again, this is another leukemia that's more common in the adult age group, usually like 50s to 60s. Um, also more common in males. So you'll notice that a lot of these patients are going to be male. Um, this is a mature B cell malignancy. Um, we have a lot of infiltration of the bone marrow um, and a lot of infiltration in the spleen. So one of the big characteristics that you'll see in these patients is massive splenomegaly. So look for that when they're describing the abdominal exam of these patients. Um, other than that, the bone marrow infiltration symptoms are going to look very similar to a lot of these other things. So again, like we've kind of reiterated multiple times, you're going to need to rely on staining or tumor markers or translocations or other things that give you clues as to which one this could be. And of course, the picture is definitely going to help you on this one. So remember, a lot of those bone marrow infiltration symptoms are going to manifest as symptoms of anemia, thrombocytopenia, you know, bleeding, fatigue, pallor, things like that. And of course, um, immunocompromise due to decreased um, ability to fight infection. So one of the key things that they might describe in the vignette is that when they try to do a bone marrow aspiration, they get what's called a dry tap, which means they're not able to aspirate any bone marrow. And that's due to just the extensive fibrosis that's present in hairy cell. Um, so when it comes to the pathology of hairy cell, um, let's see, we kind of already talked about this, but we, it's the hairy cells and then uh, trap staining is going to be one of the more common things that you guys will see. So trap positive, and I always forget what this stands for. It's tartrate, ooh, Moses, help me out here. What is it's this? It's tartrate resistant acid phosphatase. Acid phosphatase, that's what it is, right? I always remember the tartrate. So if it's trap positive, that's definitely a key finding for hairy cell. And then what is our treatment? Can anyone throw that in the chat? Cladribine, very nice. Love it. That one I don't think is as high yield as some of the other ones like the TKI for um, CML, but definitely remember cladribine. Um, if they happen to ask you a treatment question, that's usually gonna be your best answer. Usually they'll test you on the trap staining or just the picture itself. Totally agree. And just to answer a question in the chat about the marrow fibrosis, I mean, yeah. So I, I think it would be very odd for them to show you a bone marrow biopsy and a hairy cell leukemia uh, question. But I just want to point out, it's very astute for um, you know our attendees to point out the mar marrow fibrosis, because even if you look at this stain, you could sort of convince yourself that there's a dacrocyte here. Um, in a couple of different uh, a couple of different red blood cells, um, and there's actually what looks like a schistocyte here too, but um, that may or may not be clinically significant. The point being that anytime you have marrow fibrosis, you can see dacrocytes, and um, you know while the particular stains on the bone marrow are definitely not something you're expected to remember, and I won't even mention it because it's it would probably uh, be more confusing than not. Um, some of the peripheral blood findings of my, uh, fibrosis can certainly be seen on the blood smear, although it would also be a little uh, high level for that to be tested, but great pickup because that's a, that's a great point. Um, again, this is just an introductory slide to uh, lymphomas. And just like in uh, the leukemia world, we wanna offer you a sort of a way to think about this, a way to organize these diseases in your mind. And the way I think about lymphomas is to first look at the word lymph, in other words, lymphocytes, which we know come in at least two flavors, maybe three if you count NK cells, um, and then OMA, a mass. So big picture from a clinical presentation, someone walks into your office, sits down and says, doc, I'm having X symptoms. It's usually going to be the same thing, right? They Either they notice an enlarging lymph node in their axilla, in their groin, some other accessible lymph node or the lymph node is uh, impacting some organ, maybe it leads to a bowel obstruction, or um, it leads to hydronephrosis because it's blocking a ureter. Basically, it's the manifestation of a lymph node mass, either something the patient feels 
or affecting the function of an internal organ. So in addition to the mass, you have the B symptoms, the fevers, the night sweats, right, that we've already alluded to a little bit when we talked about the leukemias. Um, so that's what the patients will come in with, and we'll focus slightly less on that in the slides to come because that doesn't change really from disease to disease. Instead, we remember that lymphocytes, you know, on a very simplistic level, come in two forms. They're either B cells or they're T cells, and there are seemingly dozens of ways in which lymphomas can arise in each of those, um, each of those immune subsets. Within the B cells, the big distinction that we make is between Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. We'll have slides on that. Within the non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, which is the majority of the actual lymphomas we'll discuss today, they are either aggressive, in other words, they are expanding and the mitotic rate is super high, um, and there's a number of those lymphomas you can see on the slide, or they're more indolent. One of the paradoxes of lymphomas is that sometimes it's, and not always, but sometimes it's almost better to have an aggressive lymphoma because chemotherapy will kill it. Remember, chemotherapy targets actively dividing cells. And so if the lymphoma is dividing very fast, um, you can potentially kill off a lot of that lymphoma. Unfortunately, that isn't always the case and patients suffer you know, terrible prolonged courses um, and consequences from the lymphoma. But the, um, you sort of have a flipped side situation with the indolent lymphomas in which you know, the chemo doesn't really work all that well. Um, but at the same time, folks can live for a very long time with that lymphoma sort of brewing in their body and that's okay. And uh, there are strategies to deal with it um, when the time arrives uh, or when the symptoms become a uh, necessitate treatment. T cell lymphomas, I would say the less commonly tested, although there's a few high yield images and pathology for you all to know, and we'll highlight that along the way. Um, and so I've been talking for a little while, I'll turn it over to uh, Shelby to, uh, you know, if you have any uh, additional schemas or thoughts on lymphomas generally and, and kick it off to you for the first disease. No, I thought that was a really great overview, a really good way to kind of categorize these and break things down. Um, Categorization and organization is very important for these and kind of finding like the one or two very distinct features um, or presentations of each of these is going to really help you to differentiate one from another because they do have more similarities than differences. So organization is going to be really key in your memorization here. So we'll start off our lymphomas by talking about Hodgkin lymphoma. So we already can see our very characteristic picture over here. Um, this is our Reed Sternberg cell. So this is like the very classic picture that they love to show for Hodgkin lymphoma. So when we talk about B symptoms, this is gonna be very common for most lymphomas. So when we talk about B symptoms, what we mean is fevers, chills, weight loss, night sweats. So all kind of general inflammatory type symptoms. So these are things that you're going to be asking your patients about, or you're gonna be looking for these in your question vignettes. Um, there is a bimodal distribution of Hodgkin lymphoma, um, kind of young, younger men, like 20s, 30s, and also older men in like 60s, 70s. Um, but most of the questions that I've seen, at least for Hodgkin lymphoma, usually deal with more of the younger male population. Um, can anyone tell us, oh, we already kind of talked about this, the Reed Sternberg cell. Sorry, I gave it away. I was so excited about this picture because <laughs> it's on every single question about Hodgkin lymphoma. Um, look for your key tumor markers, so your CD15 and your CD30, so those will almost certainly be mentioned in these questions. And there are a few subtypes of Hodgkin lymphoma that are not going to be necessarily super high yield for the steps um, or for the complex, but just so that you guys know, there is the most common type, which is the nodular sclerosis type. There's lymphocyte rich, and then there's a mixed cellularity and lymphocyte depleted. So all of these kind of have to do with just the, the number of lymphocytes, basically. And remember that for lymphocyte depleted subtype, they're going to be immunocompromised, of course, because they have less lymphocytes available. And that is a brief overview of Hodgkin's. Anything to add about Hodgkin's, Moses? Uh, the one thing I would add is that the Reed Sternberg cell in in sort of the most common subtype of Hodgkin lymphoma is not the predominant cell in that mass. A lot of the other cells in there are reactive cells. Um, and it was often, it was very confusing actually for a while to figure out which cell was actually the Hodgkin's lymphoma cell. Um, 
the CD15 and 30 is good to remember for a couple of reasons. One, it's eminently testable. And two, it's not your typical B cell lymphoma marker, right? Like classically, you think of lymphoma markers, B cell lymphoma markers, at least as being CD19, CD20, CD21. This is clinically relevant because rituximab, which is also very testable in terms of lymphomas, um, is anti-CD20. Or if you want to get really fancy, the new CAR T cells, they target CD19, CD20. Hodgkin's is the, exce as the exception. It's its own thing, sort of. Um, the other little thing, and, and I promise this is the last because I just get too excited, there's a drug called rentuximab vidotin, which it depends on how quick the examiners are, are going to incorporate some of the newer drugs, but it targets CD30. And so um, these things do matter clinically. It's not just the test writers trying to torture you. These are, you know, keys or, or sort of vulnerabilities of the cancer that we can sort of go after. All right. Um, we turn next to Burkitt lymphoma. Um, and again, I'm not gonna rehash all of the constitutional symptoms because Shelby, Shelby described those so well. Um, I will just say that the demographics, you know, young adult, B symptoms, there's two uh, sort of flavors to this. It can classically be uh, in the jaw, which is more of the endemic sort of African version of, of Burkitt, um, or it can be uh, manifesting as a pelvic or abdominal uh, manifestation, which is the sporadic form of Burkitt lymphoma. Um, I'll leave my question for the end. On the right, you see uh, the very classic histo histology of Burkitt lymphoma. Um, in textbooks, you'll see this referred to as a starry sky uh, pathology. And I just wanna explain that because sometimes it's good to know why these things are named that way. So Burkitt lymphoma divides so quickly that it actually attracts what are called tingible body macrophages to come and clean up the necrotic debris of this lymphoma that is just growing so fast it often outstrips its nutrient supply. And so the stars in the starry sky, which I'm highlighting here, are the tangible body macrophages that are sort of infiltrating the tumor. And the night or the dark background is the um, sort of angry looking sort of nuclei, uh, not looking right, Burkitt lymphoma cells. So that's why it's called starry sky. And some of these lymphomas, and that's not just true of Burkitt lymphoma, but other sort of lymphoma and lymphoma-like processes, can be uh, driven by Epstein-Barr virus. This is where I turn it back to you, everyone. What is the translocation? And I know the translocations are sort of the bane of everyone's existence. The translocation for Burkitt. And folks are right on it. T814. Wonderful. Um, Shelby, anything to add on, on Burkitt lymphoma? No, that was great. This is another one of the very recognizable photos from step one and step two. So definitely remember this kind of starry sky. And it's good to know a little bit of the background of the tangible body macrophages um, just for a little extra information so that you can actually make sense of what's going on in the picture. And I'll also add that. I was sorry, I was just reading what Kim said in the chat at 8.14 p.m. Burkitt went to see Mick at the bar. I love all of these mnemonics that you guys have. These are great. Love it. So next we'll talk about diffuse large B cell lymphoma. So this is one of the most common um, non-Hodgkin's lymphomas in adults. And again, this one has sort of a bimodal age distribution, older adults, younger males. Most of these again are common mostly in males. Um, and remember that DLBCL is going to be part of our Richter's transformation, which we talked about a little bit earlier when we were talking about CLL. So in a very small minority of cases of CLL, it can actually transform into diffuse large B cell lymphoma, which is a uh, much higher grade form of uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, so they will have additional kind of B symptoms developing, again, the fever, chills, night sweats, um, weight loss, things like that, um, that indicates that their, their cancer is getting worse. Um, and you'll see rapidly progressive like lymphadenopathy. Um, so this is kind of like a dramatic presentation, or at least that's how it will be described to you, hopefully, in the question. Um, so who can tell me about the genetics of 
DLBCL, what uh, gene is affected or what is our, what's our main gene mutation that we're looking for? And you guys are quick. Awesome, BCL2 and BCL6, correct. Um, so remember that this has to do with apoptosis um, and our B cell receptors. Um, anything to add about DLBCL, Moses? One of the things I want to highlight is um, the pathology for DLBCL, like there isn't something as uh, sort of pathognomonic, right? Um, it's basically a sheet of lymphocytes that are, have a high NC ratio that are larger than they should be. Um, but, but it's not something like, ah, scary, scary sky or, 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 you know, a Reed Sternberg cell that is sort of very classic for it. Um, and so for that reason, you're probably not going to clinch this diagnosis based purely off of the picture, but it's more either because of the clinical background, like a CLL and Richter's transformation, or you've excluded the other diagnoses for other reasons um, from the vignette. Um, and lastly, I just really want to keep reinforcing this because I think uh, students can fall under the trap of being annoyed by uh, the, the biology. It has real uh, implications. BCL2 in the last couple of years has been targeted by a drug called venetoclax, and it's being used in, in sort of lymphomas, leukemias, um, and it's, direct, it's an inhibitor of the apoptotic pathway. Um, and in a paradoxical sort of way, it increases apoptosis and helps treat uh, some leukemias and lymphomas. All right, um, this brings us to mantle cell lymphoma. You'll notice that there's not a ton of text on the slide. Why is that? It's probably because there's only a couple of ways that you're gonna have this be tested, right? And it's basically gonna be the translocation. Um, the background here is that it tends to be aggressive. Um, there's nothing really in the pathology, like this is not the sort of slide that you're gonna be able to be like, yes, this is mantle cell lymphoma purely because of the slide. Um, but really they're gonna sneak in this translocation somehow. Um, and this is where I turn it over to you all. What translocation is classic for mantle cell lymphoma? Give a chance for a few folks to, to chime in. Absolutely, it's 1114. And, and just like Shelby was alluding to on the, on the last couple of slides, knowing the genes on um, these chromosomes can be helpful and might also be uh, the, the focus of a question. So what genes on these chromosomes do we really feel um, are implicated in the biology here? And you all, you all are so fast. Um, and, and putting in uh, this information, absolutely. So cyclin D1, and you'll notice that chromosome 14 comes up again and again, and that's because the immunoglobulin uh, chains, um, or at least some of them, are on that chromosome. Perfect. And like many lymphomas, CD5, you'll notice this is not the first time CD5 shows up. It's not going to clinch your diagnosis, but it might be something that you note in a vignette. Anything to add there on mantle cell? No, that was great. I think this is one of the lower yield ones for these exams, but still good to know because they will include it in the answer choices and you have to be able to rule it out, usually based on, you know, translocation or these genetic markers. So follicular lymphoma, not another one of the super high yield lymphomas, but still good to know. Um, again, this is more common in adults, usually males. It typically has a more indolent course, so it's not one of the more dramatic ones that presents right away with a ton of B symptoms. It's more of like a waxing and waning course. Um, lymphadenopathy that kind of comes and goes, fevers and chills, weight loss, not so dramatic as some of the other presentations like um, Hodgkin's. Um, but what's most commonly tested similarly to mantle cell is going to be our translocations and the genes that are involved. So who can name the translocation involved in follicular lymphoma? Nice, nice. Everyone's all ready for it. 14, 18. I love it. And then what about the genes? Somebody already put it down. Wow, you guys are so fast. <laughs> BCL2. Excellent. So remember BCL2 um, is a gene that has to do with apoptosis. So BCL overexpression is going to prevent apoptosis in these B cells, which is going to cause the cancer to proliferate. Um, I think those are pretty much the highlights of follicular lymphoma, not, not a lot of other uh, defining features for this one, unless you have anything that I'm missing. 
No, Shelby, honestly, you covered everything that students need to know about follicular lymphoma. I can't help myself just to try to give you all a, a bit of additional context. So broadly speaking, lymphomas can either be lymphomas because they're growing too fast. So example, Burkitt lymphoma, or because the cells don't die. And that's the other end of that paradigm, which is follicular lymphoma. So if you think about Burkitt, when you have a mutated CMIC, CMIC is a is a pro-growth transcription factor. So if that's messed up, it's just gonna drive the proliferation of cells. And that's why you have the, the very rapid um, progression of the disease, high mitotic rate, that explains that. Follicular lymphoma, um, you're inactivating uh, an a apoptotic gene. So what does that do? The cells can't die, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're growing any faster. They're just accumulating, right? Or at least that's a simplistic way to think about it and explains why follicular is indolent and Burkitt is more aggressive. And of course my least intelligent, but I still have to say it, I went to school in Philadelphia. The classic um, pathology here are back-to-back -back follicles. And of course, back-to-back -back, the, the uh, famous track by Drake when he was beefing with Meek Mill from Philadelphia. So that's how I always remember this, back-to-back -back, uh, follicles. But you can see here that essentially these follicles are growing. Uh, oh yes, every, I appreciate y'all in the chat who appreciate my reference. Um, <laughs> uh, you'll notice that the follicles, they're, they're not going away, right? Like normally you're not supposed to have this many follicles. They're now touching, they're, they're abutting each other. Therefore, back-to-back. All right, Shelby, take it over. And, oh, and I just did me. follicular. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my bad, my bad. I, I, I got so excited about my Drake reference that I, uh, no, I, wow. I, I, need, I, needed, I needed a breather. Uh, no, no, I can, I can definitely uh, tackle marginal lymphoma. Um, again, this is another one where you're probably, it's lower yield. It comes up less often on the exams, but the translocations is important. Um, and some of the clinical associations, because marginal lymphoma is one of those lymphomas that has a unique uh, predisposition, which is that states of chronic inflammation um, trigger an immune response, and through mechanisms that, frankly, I don't fully understand, um, in some cases, that chronic inflammation, um, perhaps due to just um, a stochastic genetic event, ends up generating uh, lymphoma. And so the ones that um, come up classically in the literature are autoimmune diseases, Sjogren's being sort of the prototypical uh, autoimmune disease, um, but also it, um, sort of chronic inflammation of the GI tract. Uh, the example here is gastritis, um, but certainly you have um, a ton of immune cells throughout the GI tract. Um, and uh, in some individuals, that inflammation uh, in a chronic form can lead to the marginal lymphoma. Um, so again, we've been playing this game all afternoon. Um, what translocation is associated with marginal lymphoma? Go ahead and put that in the chat. Beautiful. So 11, 18. This is a little bit weird. We're used to seeing chromosome 14. Marginal is one where you don't see chromosome 14. Um, and again, which genes are, are involved here? Go ahead and, and toss that into the chat. This might be a bit tougher. Give you all a few moments. All right, appreciate those who are putting stuff in the chat. Yeah, absolutely. So cyclin D1, BCL2. Anything to add, Shelly? No, that was great. Okay. And then our last lymphoma that we're going to talk about is adult T cell lymphoma. So this is kind of one of the weirder ones and it's very uh, geographically kind of confined, I guess. So you have to kind of look for these context clues in your vignettes as well. But this one is more common in Japan and West Africa and in Caribbean countries. Um, and we'll talk about why that is in a second. Um, this lymphoma comes with your typical lymphoma symptoms. So a lot of the B symptoms that we've been talking about, constitutional symptoms of fever, chills, weight loss, night sweats, you're gonna see these things over and over and over again when we're talking about all the different kinds of lymphomas. But there is one kind of special feature and that is skin lesions. So you can see in this picture, patients can get this kind of like red scaly rash and that doesn't really come with any of the other lymphomas. So again, when you're trying to memorize all of these facts about all of the different lymphomas and leukemias, always try to find the things that really stand out and are not present in any of the other ones, whether that is a translocation, 
or a gene mutation or a special clinical feature or exam finding that you won't find in any of the other ones. So the skin lesions can definitely help you to identify this one as well as the geographic clues as well. So why is this most common in these three regions of the world? So that has to do with its um, infectious origin. So do you guys happen to know the virus that is associated with this type of lymphoma? Love it. We got a couple people saying in the chat, HTLV. So this is our human T lymphotropic virus, and this is actually part of the retrovirus family, okay? So this is a special one because it has a viral association, kind of like uh, Burkitt's lymphoma with the EBV. Not a very creative name, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> um, wonderful. So that is pretty much all you need to know about T adult T cell lymphoma. Um, remember that red scaly rash, um, and that's probably the most high yield thing about it. Absolutely. And maybe I'll just take over and talk about uh, mycosis fungoides or sessory syndrome. Again, you know, the distinction between leukemia and lymphoma, it, it can sometimes be a fluid one. Lymphoma, the mass, leukemia in the blood. We saw that CLL and SLL um, are sort of two sides of the same coin, T-cell lymphomas and some of this mycosis fungoides and sessory syndrome. Um, the characteristic features for mycosis fungoides are the plaques and the patches that are characteristic of that disease. And then the sessory syndrome side of this is the progression to leukemia where you can find these malignant cells in the peripheral uh, circulation. Um, the things that are commonly tested and that I'm showing there on the, um, on the right side of the screen, um, starting with the right lower picture, that's a, a micrograph of an intraepidermal or also known as Poitrier uh, microabscess. And again, it's not an abscess that's responding to infection like we think of in 99 plus percent of cases. This is where there is a collection of uh, sort of malignant uh, white blood cells um, that are forming uh, an abscess, a collection of these cells. In the top right um, is more of a heme path association. So um, you see CD4, again, T cells, CD4, CD8. So in this case, CD4 uh, uh, T cells. And um, tough to, to see at this magnification, but um, you might see uh, the buzzword cerebriform nuclei. Basically, um, and if you squint, you can sort of see it. Uh, it. It's sort of the nucleus looks sort of bilobed, and there's these sort of undulations to the uh, the contours of the nucleus that sort of make it look like the gyri of um, uh, of the brain. And so for that reason, it got given the moniker cerebriform nuclei. But again, what are you actually going to see on the vignette? You're probably going to see the skin findings, um, the plaques, and then uh, see the cells in the peripheral blood. Um, I will just say that the translocations are super annoying. There's not much to say on this slide. It's just a reminder of sort of the chromosomes on which the recurrent uh, genes are found, the ones that sort of come up again and again in questions and, um, and when you're discussing and trying to learn these lymphomas. Anything to add, Shelby? No, the unfortunate part about, you know, leukemias, lymphomas, and malignancies in general is that there is a lot of memorization associated. You just have to know the translocations. You have to know the names of the genes involved. Um, but know that all of it is very clinically relevant. And these are patients that Moses sees probably every day. I see a lot of these patients when they come to the ED, and then I send them up to the medicine docs so that they can best manage them. But these are real patients that you guys are going to see. So just remember that you are memorizing this for a reason. Even though it is a pain right now, flashcards are your best friend for this kind of thing. Just, just get this down and you'll be able to answer any question that comes your way. A hundred percent agree. Um, you know, we're coming up on the hour for our webinar. But uh, just again to say, if you enjoyed uh, this uh, teaching format and would like something like this on a one-on-one -on -one basis, um, that's what we're about, whether that is coming up with a study schedule that fits your unique sort of personalized needs, accountability partner as you actually put the study schedule into effect, um, helping you really bone up on your areas of weakness and, and sort of capitalize on your areas of strength um, and support beyond uh, 
the exam period. Um, that's what we're here for. You know, come for the knowledge, uh, stay for the unnecessary hip hop uh, memes and references uh, in my case. Um, but as you can see, we have fun with it. And uh, if that's something that is, seems of interest to you, please reach out to us. Um, uh, we'd love to, to chat with you. Um, Shelby, any, anything to add there from sort of your experience working with students? Um, no, that was great. I think it's, I think it's cool that, you know, you guys get to choose between a huge group of tutors who are either, you know, high performing medical students like yourselves or residents who were once high performing medical students, um, and even some fellows and attendings who continue to teach because they love it and they love to tutor this content and help students succeed on their exams and get through medical school into residency into their, you know, dream job. Um, so it's very cool to, you know, work with you guys and help you guys ace your exams and do really well and learn this material so that you can excel when you finally get here, in the clinical setting, which is going to be amazing. You guys are gonna have so much fun. You just have to get through these exams first. Um, so feel free to shoot us any questions that you have either about this presentation, about really anything you'd like about a uh, blueprint or MST, about all, how all that works. Um, whatever questions you guys have, you can feel free to throw them in the chat. Shelby, you're too smart. <laughs> Everything was explained perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> and I will just and residency and consulting. Okay, so we have a question about ERAS and residency consulting. I actually don't really have experience with this. Moses, have you done this? So what I would say is, broadly speaking, um, the first step to any of this is basically to call to email, um, to contact via social media because it's very flexible. Um, and you know, I, I don't wanna to spend too much time sort of going into the nitty gritty. What I will say is that the hallmark of all of this is the personalization because obviously you all are busy, you have exams to study for, school is expensive. Um, and so there really isn't a one size fits all for uh, consulting. Um, or for sort of residency advising. Um, and so what I would recommend is if you're interested, reach out, you know, you're not, you're not signing in blood or anything um, to just get a sense of like, A, what's your question? B, what would be your metric of success? And, and C, how can we sort of integrate with um, the advising that's going on at your school to answer your question sort of succinctly um, and, and to get you to where you want to go? you would rightfully call me out and say that's vague and it's deliberate because I don't know your exact situation, what your exact question is and, and sort of how that would play out. Um, I, we're putting in the chat sort of the, the email and the phone number for you. Um, we have a, a couple more minutes uh, and maybe we can focus it on questions on leukemias or lymphomas. And if you don't have any, I, I definitely encourage you all to reach out with any further questions. And I appreciate you all for being so interactive as well. Uh, the it last definitely couple makes of years. it more interesting for us as presenters. <laughs> so we can like kind of interact with you guys, even though we're not seeing your faces, we can at least see your responses. And it does help us to feel like you guys are more engaged. And we really do appreciate that. Sorry, Moses, I just wanted to say that. No, I was just going to say that I don't see any sort of leukemia or lymphoma questions in the chat. Maybe we can give it another 10 or 15 seconds. Um, and then I know we all live busy lives, so we will sign off. Sounds but again, good. this is your last chance. Leukemia or lymphoma questions. As we wait, I'll just say, uh, just to really reinforce what Shelby was saying, that um, this is but a stepping stone. Um, this information is really to take better care of your, of your patients, keeping that long-term goal in mind. All of us went through these exams. We know how stressful uh, they can be. And so regardless of whether this is the last time that you interact with, with Blueprint or with MST, um, we truly wish you all the very best because at the end of the day, you all will be colleagues of ours in the future. And for that, for that reason, we, we lift everyone up. Alrighty, that's it from me. Shelby, any last words? No, that's great. Thank you guys so much for being here. Awesome.